Get back up. Alright, we're good. Well, I probably don't get anything, but it's always good to check. Alright, good enough. Okay, let's get my volume levels down a bit. So I want to mute my desktop volume because I've got another streamer on. And I'm going to take my... Oh, I'll leave my mic on. So you may hear someone else in the background, but... Um, that's just because I need to be entertained while I'm doing this as well. So let me just swap things around because I want to see my stream stats. Okay, that's looking good. No viewers, that's to be expected in all honesty. Um, so, we're building the DIZ2 today. Uh, you can see I've got the instructions up in the top left hand corner, top right hand corner, if I can get my uh, left and right uh, correct. And looks like the manual stuff is happening. Cool. And I've got some strategically placed logos around the screen just to hide how messy this place is at the moment. Um, just currently in the process of what's what's the best way to do it? Reorganizing. Um, so anyway, let's dive into this. Um, now I do have some option parts here. Um, so this is the front mono shock, which is pretty awesome. Um, and I think I I've, I've got the uh, steering arms. Oh, that's for the BZ3. I need to do a rebuild of my BZ3 anyway, so let's put them aside for the moment. Um, I've also got the uh, optional servo mounts, because they might come in handy. And I mean, like, I, I tend to buy, bulk buy parts from Atomic anyway, or from most manufacturers. So, as an example, this is probably going to scare most people. But I just did uh, purchase a whole lot of Ensotech stuff. Um, cables, motors... Motors, motors, speed controllers, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't ever buy one, I buy it in bulk. Uh, normally to avoid shipping fees, because shipping fees from the US to here are very, very expensive. From Asia, not so much, um, but even then, like, paying $20 once is better than paying it multiple times, so, always worth it. Um, so let me just put this together. BZ3 pivot balls. No, I need them for a different project. Uh, so pivot balls are one of those annoying things that you want a lot of from the tunnel. Um, and unfortunately, they've got a lot of different sizes as well. Actually, I'm just going to turn that other stream down a bit. Okay, so that should just be barely visible. All important screwdriver. An actual fairly decent one. The um, the reason why getting a screwdriver from Atomic, for me at least, is a big thing, is because if you look at the point on that one, it's very, very sharp. Now, when um, dealing with very, very small, tiny screws, um, you really want to make sure you're matching the screwdriver to the screws you've got. Uh, and this picture here that I've demonstrates it pretty well. Like, these screws are very, very tiny. They're M1.4 by 4s, so... 1.4 in radius, I believe, and uh, four millimeters deep. Um, they've probably got quite a deep angle to them, and it's very, very hard to determine the angle of the screw just by looking at it when it's this size. But if you've got one that's too shallow, you run a very, very big risk of stripping out the screw. So um, by providing that, you can have a reasonable guarantee that this screw is matched to the screw, uh, screwdriver is matched to the screws, and you're less likely to strip things. So. Um, I'll probably end up using the screwdriver a bit. Um, I've got my own personal favorite screwdriver I'll be using, um, but I'll be making sure that I'm using the head profile that matches the screw itself when I go off and do this. Um, so I've got some wheels. I'm probably going to fit my own LF4s. I've actually got some very, very rare LF5s on order because I ordered some stuff from HRC, including another dr drift chassis. And as far as I'm aware, they're the only people that have the LS5s. Like They're a special uh, run of tires. So... Um, if they're good, I'll probably end up buying a whole stack uh, from them again. Um, sandpaper, the grit is 3,000. I've got some 1,800 on hand, so it's kind of nice to have. Um, so this is basically for polishing more than actually um, shaving things down. Although speaking of shaving things down, I had um, was custom building some aluminium parts last night and filing them by hand. And let me tell you, that is not a fun operation when the part you're filing down is like a millimeter wide. 
and you've only got about a millimeter to grip on too. So I, I was making smaller grub screws and that's never a fun operation. So I normally start these projects by looking through the parts. Um, it's not just me randomly showing stuff to pad everything out. Um, I've had some real quality issues from Atomic in the past. Now, by the looks of things, they're a lot more on top of it. Um, you'll probably remember BMR3 talked about um, labeling the part bags. That's never really been an issue for me, an extreme issue. It's just been a minor one, but it's actually kind of nice to see them do it. The big question or not is whether um, the manual indicates which parts bag to use. And I'm just going through it now, and they don't indicate which parts bag to use. So they're halfway there, they're not fully there yet. Um, that's actually kind of irritating, but uh, not much you can do about it. Actually, while I'm at it, I'm just going to quickly post a quick message to Twitch because I realize... No, Twitter. I forgot to announce this. Um, Humpty Dumpty Dum. So this stream is going to be very, very slow and I'm not going to be making a lot of progress because you want to do this right. Wait, did I go? Oh, a final countdown. Uh, not all plastic. There's actually some brass parts here and some uh, metal parts. Uh, just let me do an announcement. Uh, what time is it here? It's currently 1.20, so hopefully this time works out a bit better for you. In fact, I should be swapping my browser around. Okay. Uh, going live, live on a DRZV2 Mini Z build come and join us as we make lots of mistakes with epoxy we're not going to be actually making lots of mistakes with epoxy i did that last night so my entire house has that burnt epoxy smell at the moment which i must admit i like in some ways it's not necessarily a bad smell <laughs> Uh, there may be something hideously wrong with me, but that's fine. I'm the one that has to live with myself, not you guys. So, more shock stuff. This looks like uh, rear shock. Uh, I'm actually using the Twitch cam to line this up and it doesn't really work. So let's get back to my real-time view. Oh, my window shifts as well. Huh, interesting. Uh, for some reason, I couldn't do application capture. I had to do entire screen capture. So they're the... I've actually got two shock shock things. You never know when these come in handy and I, I, I bulk bought springs as well. Um, so I think I ordered something like 30 separate springs because I keep on running out of the right sizes and I use them on different models. This looks like a diff. I've got some ceramic balls uh, for this diff so I'll probably end up using them. Although having a look at this, this might even be a solid axle so I might not have to worry about that. Uh, ball bearings which are nice but once again like I, I bought like a hundred or 200 from China and I haven't needed ball bearings since and they all actually funny enough ended up being really really good ones uh, I didn't know you'd expect to get like a bunch of bad ones and some good ones but it turns out they're all fairly decent so there's the screws this is the one thing I hate about atomic models is that there's probably 10 different screw sizes here whereas with the mini Z's you only have to deal with three types of screws and two different types of threads so you get button heads, uh, the recessed heads, both in the same uh, thread. And then you've got some uh, some ones that cut in, um, in the button head. So you can see the brass parts up here. The other ones are actually anodized aluminium in the yellow. So that's pretty nice. Yeah, they actually, actually do look like they're brass. I didn't notice that the last time I checked. That's kind of interesting. And here's probably one of the cooler parts. So it's carbon fiber, which is pretty normal for these things. But if you have a look at it, it's actually a yellow carbon fiber, which I've never seen before. Um, it looks really, really awesome in real life. It just captures the light in the right way. And I can sort of do that on camera, but I'm not dealing with a lot of light here. And in fact, I should probably, uh, I actually don't have a transition screen. I should turn the lights on here now. So just one moment. Oh, good. Luckily, careful placement of all the logos and everything hides at least some of the mess I've got at the moment on the couch um, and all around me. This is sort of like my model building area, so I, I've gradually working through my projects and uh, trimming down how many I'm working on at a time, but there's some RC car projects that have 
a lot of parts and I'm doing a lot of custom fabrication. Um, making custom screws, uh, cutting stuff out of carbon fibre and that's very, very messy and takes a while. Uh, let me see, what am I going to do with this box? I'm just going to put that to my right. The other big news is I ended up with another, I had my new um, mini uh, D-Nano arrive. So this is just a, a body, it's just plastic there, but um, I've now got two of these uh, that I can play around with, which is good. So it means if I break one, I've got parts. And that's the important thing because they're so rare now that getting parts is actually really difficult. So let's start with the instructions. Uh, you can see it starts with the usual format, Atomic DIZ2. Actually, let's take a quick look through. Is there anything here I really should care about? In fact, let's make another scene. Transition back to that. Copy. Chuck this here. Paste reference. Blow that up. So, resizing, that's a fun thing. And it didn't affect the screen, that's good. And then I can copy. So I normally wouldn't be doing this on the fly, but you know, I wasn't exactly prepared for this. Yeah, that looked. Okay, so let's go through this. That's all looking pretty good. These instructions are a lot simpler, simpler than um, Atomic is classically known for. Um, the color is actually a nice addition and actually helps quite a bit. Um, but the clarity and the size is actually the important thing here. Some of their previous documents were not very good. Um, they are pretty good with this turnbuckle stuff. Measuring from the inside for turnbuckles is probably not the best idea. It's much easier to do it from the outside of the turnbuckles. So I don't know if I like that recommendation. So I want to make sure I've got some calipers. Uh, here we go. And in terms of tools, um, I normally carry an action knife. I use this one because it's very, very sharp. So I use this one for opening boxes. Oh, something goes vibrating. Is that a message? That's likely a message. And I think I'm on call for something. Okay, so I, I just got a um, very, very concerned person. Uh, that is fine. Someone's doing some major infrastructure work and hit a minor bug. So um, the other one I've got is these. Uh, these are all Leatherman tools. You wouldn't typically think to use Leatherman tools, but this one especially is useful in the field. Uh, the reason being is... A, there's no knife on it, so you can take it on an aeroplane, but more importantly, it's got this file with a semi-pointed end, and this turns out to be very almost perfect for prying batteries out of things, so I like it for that. But having just a pair of pliers on there as well is just generally useful. I normally use this for gripping uh, shaf um, shafts for shocks and things and popping heads off and that sort of thing, so over the last couple of days, it's been an absolute lifesaver. And I've got a third one, but uh, another leather, on, but I'm probably not going to use it at this point. Um, the head just isn't nearly as fine, but if I have to hold something with a lot of force, I might grab that out. Um, okay, so this is nice. This is not bad at all. They obviously didn't clean up the URLs, but that's fine. This is going to be annoying. So set screws of this size are always painful, but you see this process here, these spaces look massive. They're actually not. Um, and this is another thing I bought in bulk because I ended up losing them. And once I hit the floor, you can't see them anymore. And if you're building on a white surface like I am, they're also very, very difficult, but getting this all lined up is painful. Um, you get the shaft all the way into there. Then you have to insert these down and get them perfectly aligned horizontally and vertically before you can push the shaft through. And that can be really, really difficult. It's very easy for them to just like 
when you put force on here, have them like shoot out um, and lose them. And they don't provide enough spares in my opinion. Um, so that's, I, I hate the setup, but we'll see what happens. It'd be nice if there was a way there was like a screw or something that didn't offset, but uh, yeah, I don't like white spaces are horrible. Uh, duh, 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 two either side. Maximum caster angle. 15 degree, each 0.3 move is one degree change. Is that, I think that's supposed to be 1.5 degree, not 15 degree. But we're going to go for maximum caster. Um, so two at the front. Um, now pr I have built the DRZ and I built the super skater kit. Um, I'm, I've got particular concerns around these uh, ball housings. Um, my right, no, my left ball housing, so this one, uh, no, this one actually, on the steering arm, always pops off with the slightest bit of force. Um, so if I get that happening, uh, I'm probably going to replace these ball caps with something uh, like with other ones I've got, because I've got some that are better quality than others. So there'll be a lot of test fitting uh, on this front carriage part. Um, asymmetrical knuckles, it's good to note that now. I th they're probably asymmetric so it makes it easy to identify, but either way, I'm glad I read through this before I blasted on the head. Ball bearings. I do want to get some spaces for the internals here. Um, I've got the plans to print them for mini Zs. Um, there's reasons to do that, uh, mainly with how the ball bearings behave under load. If you've got a spacer in between the ball bearings in the center here, you can actually compress them a lot uh, to their maximum compression and have the ball bearings still freely rotate. If you don't, then they pinch in the middle and um, they start to rub. So I've got some wheels that are just slightly too loose. I need these spaces internally. Uh, okay, that's all relatively simple. I've got a feeling we should be able to get to step nine in fairly decent clip so it's now approaching two o'clock at my end i really don't want to go past i want to say four o'clock because i want to take a break for an hour and then do some streaming with battles uh, battle tech this afternoon oh we might even do this okay so this is a ball diff and an open diff so we can actually build this open and then if I feel the need, uh, I'll pop it off and compact it with either a thick grease to make it a limited slip differential uh, or epoxy and make it a fully locked differential. But we'll see what the performance of the DIZ uh, is like first um, and how tight this is. Because there was one time where I filled this with a loose grease um, just to make it a limited slip differential with quite a bit of slip. And under high speed, because I put a very, very high speed motor on it, um, it spat the grease out through this gap here or this seam. So hopefully this is recessed. And if this is recessed, um, then I won't have to worry about it. And I'm hoping that's plastic as well, because this is already very, very heavy. And the less weight you have on here, the more responsive to acceleration changes the car is. Um, what else do we have while I'm at it? Okay, there's not too many people watching, which is both good and bad. Um, button heads, flat heads. Luckily, the rear wheel drives are normally pretty quick to build. The fiddly stuff is with the suspension. Um, so they're using the better suspension on the back. Uh, you know, we don't have to put any pins in and have spaces. It's, they just give you pre-molded um, uh, little bumps here. But the one thing we will have to do is, and this is where that... Um, sandpaper comes in handy is while we're doing this fit it uh, check to see if it binds even the slightest bit of binding uh, sandpaper it down put it back and so it's not that any of these steps is expensive individually it's that all the minor fiddly uh, calibration work just takes for, uh, forever and that's where the distinction between a good build and a great build is is in is how much extra prep work you do uh, brass spacer, flathead, standard spur gear alignment. Looks like they've actually used the um, same spur gear setup here as the SZ and the uh, BZ 
oh, what what is it the 2017 or the newer one or the bz3 where you actually slide the spur gear on top of the spur gear adapter and use an o-ring this is really really nice because i have a whole bunch of these spur gears in different sizes now so it makes changing the gear uh, size very very simple um, this is actually a really really nice setup so i appreciate that they uh, did this for the drz as well um, okay so i'm seeing this ball head here or half a ball head I have seen this being a bit painful in the past, or a bit fiddly, mainly because they use really, really tiny screws here. Um, but this is looking very, very similar to the DIZ. It looks like the front end and the brace system is different, but that's about it. Um, I do have some universal shafts. Let's see what they provided, because I've got some high quality long ones. And depending on the quality of theirs, I will use theirs, because I want to save those high quality ones for the BZ. Okay, so they're the standard atomic ones. So this is just the uh, swing shaft here. It's hard to make out. Um, also, also known as a CVD. Uh, let me just pull one out for you. So I only see two here, which makes a lot of sense because you only need them for the rear wheels. So I've got the shaft there. There you go. So it runs, it moves fairly move, smooth. So if you can pick it up and have it drop to the bottom like that, that means it's relatively good. If there's any binding, that's when it's an issue. But you do have to remember, because this uses a double pin system, you want to be rotating it at the same time. Um, and just make sure that it does this at all. Yeah, look, so there's a tiny bit of bind there. I'm not going to be able to do much about that, but it really depends on the angles that they're at because um, it's got a pin going like that and a pin going down in different places. Um, if you get the right combination of the two, it will bind slightly, and you just have to live with that, unfortunately. So Let's drop that back in there. Let's go back to the manual. Um, pins. Okay, so it looks like the back is not that configurable, which is fine. Uh, now, I don't like this. The fact that you have to cut the cap, that's very, very prone to error. Uh, I definitely much prefer... And they're measuring from the inside again, which is stupid and silly. Um, it's really difficult to do with calipers, especially when you've only got 2.5 millimeters worth of space to play with. So um, if I was atomic and I was making any recommendations, I'd be using the outer diameter rather than the inner. Um, it just makes it a lot simpler. Um, and even if you have a flat end on the edge here, that makes uh, making sure you've got the total length even easier. Although I suppose we've got a, a flat edge on the steel link, so we might end up using that, but I don't know what the length of this is. Well, I can measure that. Yeah, I can measure that, and I'll, I'll just have to math it out. Uh, this is good. You have to be careful about these mini um, cuts because over time they can wear out a bit. So I'm not necessarily a fan of the granularity of configuration here because of that. Um, but that's fine. I haven't had too many issues. I normally set it once and leave it at the default settings. Um, we've got grease shocks. They've got an indentation here, which is good. But I mean, grease shocks are grease shocks. Um, they're just a pain to get on and off. Like if there's even, if you come in at even a slight angle, they don't mate very well. Uh, rear spring has thin wire. Okay, this is very, very interesting. Okay, I'm going to pay attention to this polish advice because um, getting your shocks right, you have to do it at the beginning. Once you've applied grease, you've essentially contaminated the surface and it just makes things very, very difficult to fix up after the fact. So definitely pay a heed this advice and get it all sorted. Um, and... It's going to be interesting what they mean about smooth. So smooth is not going to mean an exact fit in there because you want grease to be the mating layer between the uh, outside diameter here and the inside here. So if it is, if it only just fits, you're going to end up with really, really bad suction. Um, and that may or may not be what you want. So uh, attached dampers, that's pretty standard. Balls, reefer, flatheads, yep, that's all good. That's all good, except I I don't think we'll be starting off with the monoshock. Um, I do want to go with the dual independent suspension here um, and at least check what the throw is like. 
and then we'll go to the monoshock. Um, I do want to compare and contrast that because I brought this question up on the Mini Z subreddit um, about uh, and in various places on YouTube. No, it was on YouTube. It wasn't on the, the subreddit um, about what the difference is. And I went off and researched it and everyone's talking about throwing the weight around and putting weight on the outer wheel. And a couple of people were doubtful. And after hearing their explanations, I definitely have to agree with them. So they did suggest some things that may make it a lot better for, which is uh, drifting at an angle while going forward straight. And if that's the case, it'll be useful. But uh, by testing out both, we'll be able to determine like why a monoshock is better um, and then allow you to make your own decision. So standard servo horn. Uh, I didn't get electronics, so I'll bring you, you bring my own servo. Um, I'm, I've got a very, very particular taste in servos. Um, Beaver, Beaver's Hobbies recommended one particular type of servo, and I've just been buying them exclusively because they've just been awesome. Like, I bought one once, and it, it's just been so much better than everything else on the market that I've used. I do, however, have some atomic-specific servos, so if I feel the need, I can always equip one of the red ones there. Um, this is pretty normal. This is pretty normal. Nice to see that we've got a sliding plate set up here. Wait a minute, is that a sliding plate? Yeah, it is, because they're binding there and there. That's interesting. I'll have to look into that more. Uh, top head. Oh, okay, yep, yeah, so we can change the platform length. I will admit I don't know what length platform I want. Um... I do have, actually, let me go grab some models. Um, whoops, that was probably a very, very bad move on my part. Um, I do want to build this as a rally car, so we do have some choices here. Okay, no damage. So we've got a uh, Lancia, one of the later ones. I think this is our last model. Uh, I kind of like it. It's small. From memory, this is a 90 millimeter. So it'd be nice to have a 90 millimeter wheelbase drift car. Um, I th I'm not sure if that was a two wheel drive or a four wheel drive, but I know this one, the uh, Lancia Stratos, which is a personal favorite of mine, is actually a rear wheel drive car. Um, so this could be a lot of fun. It comes with wheels and everything. Um, like, this car to me is just iconic. So, um, let's see. We've also got the Celica, uh, which probably a lot more people know about. Um, they just started re redoing this um, Celica model. So I picked one up because the ones on eBay were stupidly expensive. And I've been generally pretty happy with the quality of this. So the ones I've seen online have been a bit yellow um, in the whites. Um, and I think it's just the older style plastic. Uh, this seems to be an, a modern take or modern update on it, so I could very much use this one. And then I've seen someone actually do all all the lights on the front here with LEDs, and that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, and then finally, you've got the Subaru. Um, I've been wanting more Subaru bodies, uh, like I really badly wanted one of the traditional STI uh, sedan models, but I'm pretty happy with the hatchback, to be honest. Um, it's a lot nicer and a lot prettier in person. Um, and this could also be a lot of fun. I think this is also a similar wheelbase. Yeah, I'm going to say it is. Um, it's, sometimes it can be hard to tell. So Let me just put those to the side so I don't break things. Because we need to get onto the build in the next couple of minutes. Um, let's go through it. So, offset 101.5s, 102.0s, that's normal. I've got all the calibration tools for droop, so that's not a problem. And separate servo mount. I've got the lipos already. I use a very, very specific type of plug. Do I have one handy? I might. I really need to organize this area a bit more, but whatever. No, I don't have one handy, so. Okay, that's looking good. So, like, my YouTube channel is just going off these days, um, which is nice. 
end of assembly. So 21 steps, or 21 pages each with about two steps, so about 40 steps. We're definitely not gonna be able to do it in one session, but what we can do is make as much progress as we can. So let's dive into steering post step one. So change back to here this. I do like those transitions. OBS has definitely made my life a lot easier for this sort of stuff. Um, we're going to use one of these to hold our parts so they don't go away. Uh, what else? Okay, I think that's nearly everything. I don't know if I want any additional tools, but I'll grab them as I need them, I think. Hopefully they've given us most of the tools we need to build this, so that'll be a plus if they have. Let's take out the base chassis. So this carbon fiber is pretty good. So they've definitely upped their quality on the carbon fiber. Um, these flat areas, there aren't as many manufacturing defects on it. The edges are exceptionally smooth, which is an improvement. Um, and everything, everything looks uh, like the countersinks, uh, countersinks on this are exceptional. Um, I wouldn't say there's been quality issues, but sometimes you notice a bit of unevenness in previous uh, models. But this one, it looks absolutely rock solid. So I don't know if they've got a new manufacturer, but I really hope they've addressed their quality issues because like, I've had a lot of complaints with them in the past. And oh, there's been a couple of occasions where I've actually, um, they haven't shipped parts and had to contact them or there's been delays and parts and everything. And they haven't been the most, their support department is not the most receptive. They don't seem to keep a case history or anything like that, which is makes things a bit difficult. So I need the screws. So I'm yeah, like while these bags are labelled, they're not really labelled in any useful way, and the fact that they don't have the screws in them kind of indicates that they haven't got the concept of labelling down pat. And the reason I say that is you want the screws to be in the bags. You don't want a generic screw bag. Um, and you probably want a visual guide on the instructions itself with a one-to-one -one scale so that you can print it off and actually compare the bolts against it. Luckily, I've got the calipers, so I can just measure the M2 and the 7 or the M2 and the 16. Um, but if I didn't, then I might use an M8 where I should be using an M2. So I need that, and then I need the bar from here. Okay, so I've got the bar. Yeah, black doesn't really show up well. Like, this camera is good, it's, but it's not that good. Although I'm going to say that's a hard problem. Okay, so that we're gripping into the plastic. We want that to be down. We're actually going to here, that there. Now we want two M7s and an M16. Who doesn't want an M16? Oh, that was Final Countdown's moment to shine, but he didn't take the bait. Okay, so we turn the calipers on. They're running out of batteries pretty badly. And I move it to 16. And then I measure the screw, which is very, very simple. And we are way off that being an M16. So M16 is obviously the largest screw I've got in here then. Now the other thing to do is check the threads. Um, you might have some threads that don't go the full length. I don't know if that's the case for this kit, but sometimes you might get somewhere that's uh, just um, like there's no thread on it at all. Um, and then also double check the model and just make sure that the thread on your screw actually matches what's on the picture. Uh, and that's just a trick learnt. Okay, so that's an M16. That's a trick learnt from other model building. Um, sometimes they've got like a normal shaft at the top for very, very specific reasons. Uh, such as rotating parts. And you want to make sure that you're um, observing that. So I'm just going to screw this in by hand. There's no reason to use a screwdriver yet. Kind of surprised that they're using an M16 on this part. Oh wow. You're kidding me. So, that's interesting. 
Are these all... These are hex heads. So that screwdriver is totally useless. At least for this part. Let's bring in my one of my goodies tool bags. Grab you and we will grab you. So this one is just rear gears and springs and to give you an idea of why I buy in bulk like that's probably about 40 or 50 springs there and like that's easily over 100 screws here um, and there's probably about 30 gears there so um, this is probably my smallest parts bin as well so that should give you a rough idea of just how many or how much I keep on hand in terms of parts So, that's a fit, we'll just screw it in by hand, like that, and make it finger tight, yep, I can still move it. So, back to my favourite screwdriver, absolutely love this thing. I wouldn't, th I didn't think I'd ever love a screwdriver as much as that one, but, um, wow, it, does, it just makes everything feel so much nicer, and it's got some very, very, uh, it's got some features that make it very, very nice to use. Oh, let's zero you out. So it's got a ball bearing on the end, so the end rotates. And normally you have like a, uh, a moving end cap or something, and that normally works fine. Can I just say that's an M7? But it feels more like an M6, to be honest. Let's zero that and then go back minus six five one. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah, so it's got a ball bearing in the end. And it just rolls really, really nicely. So it means I can put pressure on like that and continue to rotate with no issue. Which makes it a bit different. Um, normally when you put uh, pressure on an end cap, it makes it hard to rotate. Not so much with this one. Let's grab another one of you. Now, you have a head like that, you've got a head like that. Sweet, let's screw in. And we'll use their provided screwdriver for this. I'm not going to swap heads. Um, like, while the heads are easy to swap with one hand on this, um, it's annoying and fiddly to do. I'd rather just have two with the two most common parts I've got, but since I've got a screwdriver for the other one, we'll just use that. Wait, is that even threaded? I don't even think that's threaded. Oh, you know why? It's actually got to dig into something, doesn't it? Uh, so this is going to be a very, very slow stream. So feel free to ask questions. I don't think there's anyone else actually on here at the moment. But if you are, um, I'm here for entertainment as much as you are for here for entertainment. So feel free to chat and get me to to uh, answer stuff about Mini Z, and I'll do it to the best of my ability. Yeah, so th this has got a, a moving, rotating end, and like as I'm pushing, putting force on the back, it's not rotating nearly as smoothly. Okay, that went fairly well. Now I'm very, very prone to over tightening things, and I'm gonna have to make sure I don't do that. And I can see Yoshi's Island is going really, really well on the stream I'm watching, so that's good. Um, rotate that in, and then we'll just go back and only sort of finger tight all the screws. The stuff binding into plastic parts, like the first time you do it, they actually don't need to be that tight. Um, because it, the plastic, it's the first time it's really gone into the plastic and it sort of keeps it in there. So I'm just going to make sure this is below the carbon fiber line, so there's not no edges protruding. Uh, close enough. Do that and that. That's good. And then we do... Uh, 
I might need to adjust the focus on the camera and go back to autofocus mode. Okay, that's good. That's step one. M2 flathead, uh, M1.4 flathead. So we need some parts from the same parts bag. And another parts bag already. Wow. So that looks like it's going to go that way. Let's leave it on there for the moment. It's not that bag. It's not that bag. Oh, Dentomy already took out. No, it's not there. Oh, yeah, it's in the um, the chassis bag. That was a bad place to put it. Oh, right, okay, because it is actually carbon fiber, so that's a carbon fiber bag. So there we go. Two pieces like that. And we'll have to make them together. So how does that all fit together? That actually goes through the top. And this is countersunk, so the countersunk parts have to go to the top. And we just push that together, and that's held in by friction until we screw it. So they want it flat, but it's not really wanting to go flat. So that's not a good sign. It rotates a bit. Because of the size of the part here, um, specifically around the sides here, you really want to be careful that you don't break that. So I'm actually going to bring out the sandpaper early because this part, I'm not going to, it's not really a precision part, so I can overfile it a bit. But if it's too tight, that's actually risks damaging the part. So. The question is, do we shave back the carbon fiber? Or do we shave back the plastic? And the answer to that should actually be very, very simple. You should never be shaving back carbon fiber. Um, it's a lung irritant because uh, of the particles. And what people may not know is I've actually had a double lung transplant. And so I've got to be very, very careful about irritants in the lung because that is a good way to have your lungs rejected. So, let's just bring that back. It doesn't have to be good. Um, I don't care if people see it, but this is a pretty invisible part. And you should really only need to polish it a bit. You shouldn't have to take off much material. But this is one of these things where you take off a bit, you put it on, do a test fit, realize you haven't taken off enough, and just keep on repeating the process. And this is why this stuff is so fiddly. But with, with how they've designed some of these pieces, and you can actually see why it's bad here. There's actually not much material here, so we'll actually have to be careful when pushing in the screws because of that. Let's get out our trusty pliers for the moment. Let's see how that goes. So I'm not going to apply much force. I just want to see if under force, if it does compress a bit more. Doesn't seem to. Okay, so we're going to rotate that to pop that off. And we're going to go back. To, uh, we're gonna take off some more material, but we're gonna do it in a much better way. So the problem with sandpaper is it's flexible. And the issue seems to be occurring halfway up the side here. Uh, can we make that out? Yeah, half up the side here. It's starting to bind. So this flat head or um, triangular shaped one, this is a bit more of an aggressive profile, so I can take off more material faster. And the, uh, the strength in sides mean it's much easier to get a straight cut. And also get into all the small places, so...
Ah, so boring, boring stuff on stream. Um, but big shout out to Admiral Salty because he's actually keeping me entertained at the moment. Even just having background noise is nice, but having a distraction while doing this is very, very important. Like, I find this to be, I enjoy building, but wow, do I find it dull and, uh, sometimes. Like, I normally have to be watching a movie or something while I'm doing this, otherwise I, I just go insane. Okay, so that's helped a bit. So, this is actually not a bad sign if I'm on step two and I'm already encountering some pretty massive issues. If you were new to this process and you didn't know you might that filing parts down like this may be the only way to make them fit, you could do some significant damage to the chassis at step two. Um, and I don't say Atomic's famous for it, but I've hit a lot of issues like this with, with Atomic builds. Like some of this stuff is really, really good. And then there'll just be like basic usability issues that are so easily avoidable. They just really make you question. I, I think the builders were probably perhaps a, a little bit too good and didn't include some of the basic stuff. So I'm lucky that my first atomic build went relatively smoothly and I picked up some of this stuff without breaking anything, but wow. I mean, if this was, if you, if the DRZ V2 was your first project, um, that would not be a lot of fun. Okay. Okay, that went on a bit better. Let's try and clamp it down. Okay, now it's going down a lot better. So it didn't take much material to make it fit better, um, but it was definitely worth our time. Although it doesn't look like it's uniform all the way around. So I've still got a bit of a show stop at the front here. There we go. And we'll just do one last round to make sure it is actually all even all the way around. Uh, yeah. Keep in mind using pliers likely not the best thing um, I can actually be damaging a plastic on the inside here and you probably didn't notice but I was checking it with my um, spare hand, uh, spare finger when I was doing that just to make sure I wasn't over compressing and damaging it um, these have a fairly flat but limp uh, fairly flat ridges down the bottom here and then get more aggressive further up um, but I've still got to be very very careful about that it was somewhat risky so now going to go and try and find these M14s. And in all honesty, they're probably not going to look like the picture. Uh, the picture is going to be a very idealized version. But we're looking for a couple of key attributes. So you can actually make that out from the picture. These are countersunk, as you can tell by the somewhat sharp profile there. And the fact that it's got a green countersunk hole. So I just picked up a button head, but it looked very, very similar to a countersunk. And we'll have to make sure that the threads match. So we need a very, very fine thread screw. Actually, how big is four millimeters? Because I tend to forget. Uh, let's zero that out. Oh, okay, M4 is larger than I thought. So that's a small button head in that case. Um, I did see those. Where are you? You are an M4. Although your head is way too large, so maybe I need to find something with a smaller head. It's not you. It's not any of you. Oh wow, it looks like they've got different varieties of the ultra tiny screws as well. Once again, a very, very bad mistake on their part. In fact, I'm going to... It's always important to have a container for small parts around. They're just too easy to lose. But it does make going through them a lot simpler. So that's an M4 because it's countersunk. And even if you don't wear glasses... 
Wearing glasses for this kind of close-up work can really, really help. Is that actually truly? No, that's not even countersunk. Although, in all honesty, maybe they're, they're using bund heads in place of countersunk because it's so small. So let's say you are... More M5-ish. M4-6. And with half mil bun head. Yeah, okay. I could accept that. What about you? You could be a possible candidate. The, I mean, this is a primary reason why you only want to be using one type or like a limited handful of screws. Because this is an absolute nightmare. If there's just like only three of these screws in there, um, there's a high chance I'm going to be using the wrong screws for this step. And once you put a wrong screw in, if it's a different like thread or something like that, uh, you're done. Like, oh, that's going in pretty smoothly. Are these pre-threaded? They're pre-threaded. Okay, that went in fairly well. Yeah, so you shouldn't be mixing things like uh, uh, five mil length and six mil length because they're too close to tell apart. You want to be at least like two mil apart, and you only want to have a limited amount of different threads. Ideally, you want like one sized thread, possibly two max. Um, so like an ultra fine uh, pitch, for example, and a, uh, a normalish digging pitch, um, just so that you you can quite easily get all the screws you need. And like custom parts are bad parts every single time because they're normally the most fragile. And uh, like custom screws, for example, they're uh, you lose one, and they normally only provide one, and you're stuffed. And I'm actually working on top of the carpet at the moment, which is somewhat dangerous. Let's pull that out. Cool. Okay, so that's the center cr uh, crank done. Um, I'm just going to give it one last final tighten. With screws this small, um, incredibly easy to strip. So if you encounter any resistance at all, just back off. Now, I did actually feel the screws go a bit underneath like that. And I'm actually glad that it's in the design document that they do go past there because I was a tiny bit worried that I was using screws that were too long, so that's good. Gonna get some bearings now. And we're gonna pay very, very close attention to the bearings. And I'll explain why in a moment. So that's a sealed bearing. And I've got some half open bearings. Now seal bearings rotate a lot smoother. Uh, there and there. Um, but they do pick up dust a bit easier. So I'm assuming they want sealed bearings for this. Although maybe they actually want the sealed bearings on the front. So let's just quickly pop this out. It's hard to tell because they don't actually indicate what bearings you should be using here. They just say 362, they don't say half shielded, fully shielded. So if there's only a single bearing on the front, um, we're in trouble because we want both sides to be sealed. But if they use two, two oh, I'll show you when we get to it, what I mean. Uh, okay, so they're using two. They've got one on the inside and one on the other. So you've got the unshielded part to the inside so you don't pick up dirt and dust. And we'll just use a shielded on this bearing. Um, because it adds a bit more resistance. And I don't mind a bit of extra resistance on the steering wheel. You won't notice it as nearly as much as you will on the tire. Okay, we push that down to make it flat. Push it again. Do a quick test fit. A lot of play there. A lot of play. How does that go on with the steel collar? Okay. 
that doesn't matter that there's a bit of play in that case. So let's go back. Now, here's another thing to watch out for is flanged um, bearings versus non-flanged and adding a spacer. Um, it's very easy to get those two mixed up. So, and apply instant glue. I don't like that. I really don't like that I have to apply instant glue. And I think that's all in a different bag as well. Yep, there's a flange. So let's quickly take the flange out and do a quick test fit. Um, and then if that's all good, we'll take the ball bearings, the, uh, the ball head screws from here. And I will have to find some instant glue because it's not something I normally deal with. So flange goes on. Yeah, still a bit of play there. And I mean, I can visually see a crack there. Well, not a crack, a uh, space there, so... Maybe the tolerances fix themselves up later. Um, but what else do we have here? I'm just going to quickly measure these um, bearings because I've got a distinct feeling that there's multiple different heights here and I've overlooked that fact. So we're dealing with an M63 or a 36M, I don't know. So you are only 1.5, but you are 6. And then you're probably three on the inside. And you're three on the inside. So you are a classic example of that. So these bearings might be a bit thicker than what we wanted. That's what I'm concerned about. Getting these out after the fact can be difficult, but you accumulate tricks over time. Oh yeah, you're thicker. No, you're exactly two on the dot, so we wanted two high. Okay, so these are the right bearings. So we put you back. Now, we very, very carefully put everything back in the bag. Because uh, otherwise I'm going to lose parts. So, I mean, if this is your first time building a model, um, you're probably starting to begin to realise just how tedious this is and how slow it is. It's definitely rewarding. It's a lot more, probably a lot more entertaining for me than this for you watching. Um, so I highly recommend you do what I did and um, put some stuff on in the background, some music, some videos, and do two things at once so you're not wasting your own time. Okay, so we want those ball heads, so I'll start with you. Be very, very careful when tipping everything out. So there's a bunch of these white things and you can see them on the camera because they're just catching the light. We're going to need a lot of those spaces. So we need one of you, one of you, we need two spaces. And now we need a flange. And there we go, we need a flange one there. So if I'm lucky, it can be hard to tell, but they actually take on the top a uh, hex head. The problem is having a hex screwdriver that's the right size. Now if you've got those Allen keys, um, they're normally such low quality that you're going to end up uh, stripping them out. So I actually recommend a really decent tool for uh, something like made out of harder metal or something that is not going to strip its sides and end up destroying the, uh, the part. Okay, so I don't actually have anything that's the right size here. So I'm actually going to do something silly and actually use their provided parts. I shouldn't say that silly, but I've just been burned by it too many times now. So I mean, the fact that they give us three Allen keys, once again, not a good sign. But... Two maybe? Three is kind of scary. There you go. So the black 
uh, allen keys are normally pretty bad uh, silver ones are normally uh, indicate a higher grade metal um, so I'm less worried about that but it's much easier to do this with a screwdriver now their advice is to uh, apply instant glue to this I'm likely not going to do that the reason being is I know I'm not going to get through this entire build on camera so I might just do this off camera Okay, that's finger tight. I really should be using some tweezers here, but I don't want to get up and get them. And there's tricks you can do without tweezers, so... Pushing the part into the washer is normally significantly simpler. Oh, and in fact, I actually threaded that on the wrong side, so we'll go back and fix that shortly. So yeah, always observe part orientation, because that will always end up hurting you. And also put everything onto the Allen key and then work from the Allen key itself. Um, also a good trick is to push up against your finger like that, especially if you've got spaces on. It uh, helps retain everything. Then you use your fingers to line up and a second hand to screw in. And that didn't work. God, these small fiddly parts are always so annoying. So we can try a different approach. We're actually going to rotate, keep the uh, Allen key straight and then rotate the part underneath. This is normally good for uh, initially threading parts. Um, and then you can rotate it in once you're confident. And then any sign of resistance, you just back off. So I'm putting some pressure on the system here. Oh, how do I do that? And it's resisting. So I'm going to leave that as is. And I'm going to thread the next one. Put my I was going to say put my finger up against it, but no. Uh, if a part starts bouncing, don't go and chase after it. The reason being is you might bash things like a screw tray and end up making things worse. Okay, so we do that. Do that. Oh man, I've probably just lost a white spacer. Now you know why I hate these things. You only get so many white spaces, but as I said, I've got a collection of, I put bags of them, so I, uh, I'm not, it's not a major loss. Come on, get on. How about you? You're looking like a better candidate. No. And I just had my phone go off, so I'm going to have to check that in a sec. People breaking things at work. And we will put the part underneath to support it. And then we put it on the ground. We then line everything up and rotate the part underneath. This technique actually makes it very, very, a lot simpler to get parts in straight. So, at least for that initial bite, which can normally be uh, very, very difficult. So now that that's gone, I'm not going to answer that SMS from it immediately Someone just giving me a warning that stuff's going to break Monday morning. And I can ignore it. Well, actually I can't, but I don't have to worry about it too much. Okay, so we're getting closer now. 
Now they did say to make sure that it doesn't bind and it doesn't. So we will now redo that screw that I stuffed up. So what's the time? Yeah, it's now taken us 30 minutes to do two steps. <laughs> Maybe my original time estimates were slightly off, but... I have to work out how I put this up on YouTube, so I'm saying interesting things. Um, at least for the intro it was interesting, but I think the actual build part, I'll just have to speed up individual parts and work out what is actually in interesting and what's not. I'm actually surprised I've even got two viewers at the moment, so... Uh, bell crank, plastic lock nut. Bell crank. Oh, that goes on like that. Um, do I have any glue? That's a big question. Or do I have any glue within reach? No, I don't. Uh, so... Let me just do one thing. It's going to go blank for a bit. That's fine. That's fine. Don't panic. No one panic. Be right back. Let's try that again. Be right back uh, da, 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 da. what if I pull on that hey would you know it enlarges okay so we'll be right back in a sec uh, I'm just going to quickly glue apart And we're back. Now I didn't glue the part, but I do did know that I've actually got some glue nearby and accelerant. Uh, so we will work with that. Now the other thing I've got nearby that's really really handy, and you'll see why in a sec, is mini Z parts. Because they come with this nice wonderful plastic tub. Um, so I don't have to worry about getting glue everywhere. Let's push out that collar. That's good. Now we take the... That's the glue. That's the accelerator. Let's open up the accelerator. Like I said, let's open up the accelerator. Yep. Now, you see, you'll actually see why I uh, always have a multi-tool when doing this sort of stuff. Because I've got some really very powerful uh, carbide cutters on it. Which end up being very, very useful for some very, very specific tasks I do. So if you ever want to cut like uh, suspension um, shafts and that sort of thing, or mini Z ones, especially the... Uh, the hardened ones and the fluoride coated ones um, you need something like carbide cutters and there's a couple of mods I've had to do um, where I've actually had to cut those so cool. uh, so we'll lift that up like that and let's get stuff flowing first actually let's Maybe I have to cut back a bit further. Okay. 
first things first, always make sure you use two hands, especially when it comes to glue. The last thing you want is a glue explosion all over your clothes and face. Okay, and we just clean up the end there. Looks good. And we do a final poke in the end to clean up the edge. It's looking good. Do a bit of a test one. I've got the distinct feeling there's a cap I need to take off. Now I struggled with this before and this is once again where pliers are really good. Oh, man. Okay, so I, there isn't a cap which is good, it's just not coming out very well. May take a bit. There we go. Okay, squeeze like hell again. Put that on there. Okay, that's good. Now, always put your cap back on. I don't like this particular brand. Um, it's just what I had on hand. The reason I don't like it is because the screws, the, the tops don't screw back on. And it's very easy for the head to come back off. So it's actually somewhat dangerous. Like if I go off and knock that now, um, which I'm not going to do, but I have done in the past, I can end up with glue all over the place. And that'll just totally ruin the model. I should say car, but you know, it's going to spend so much time on the uh, shelf anyway. Cool, that's done. Uh, clean up the excess. The reason you want to clean up the excess with uh, super glue when using an accelerant is that accelerant might still contain glue. So you might end up with seize bearings if you're not careful. But that looks good and I'll hide you under the camera where no one can see us. And we're just going to quickly test, yep, okay, the bearing still rotates, so that's good. I'm going to call that a success. Throw away that. And that means we can continue on with putting the cap on. That goes down. Let's put that on first. Bum 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 bum. Oh yeah, that feels. So there's still a bit of wobble there, but they do mention putting a cap on top, and that might fix the issue. So where did? No, it's not that. So I'm just missing a hub tie. Oh, you know what? I'm not even going to bother because I provide one. And the nice thing is I actually provide a really, really good hub uh, tightener. So it's one of the few things I have not been disappointed in when I've dealt with them in the past. Observe direction and let's screw that on. Making sure we keep it straight because these are plastic ones and they can veer off to the side. Ok, 
Okay, that's moving. And I'm just backing it off fair, like about an eighth of a turn. So since I put that uh, nut on top, there's no longer any wobble anymore. So it's just like the manual says, which is great. Let's put that back in there. And while I'm at it, I'm going to move these parts back into here because they're a bit of a risk at the moment. All it would take is for me to do something stupid and they'd be all over the place. Okay. Oh, and speaking of mistakes, gripping things too tightly is definitely one of those. What I should be doing is actually this. It looks like everything. These are plastic white uh, spaces, also tend to stick to even the slightest bit of sweat on your hands. So always double check that it fell in and always seal the bags. Pro tip. Okay, so I'm going to say that's reasonably smooth, but I'm going to back it off a bit more to see if I can make it even more. Oh yeah, that's what I want. So now just tightening it even less and less. Kind of like it there. Doesn't quite spin around, but that's fine. The motor is more than powerful enough, but there's not a lot of resistance. Okay, so we're now getting into some of the rear, or the front suspension. So one of these bags is going to be rear suspension, one of them is going to be front. That springs. Oh, I probably want this bag. Yeah, I want this bag. Anything hanging off the desk is a liability. Like, I've, I've screwed up more of these builds by knocking parts onto the ground than I care to admit. Um, so this is probably not the ideal working environment, but it's what I'm what I've got to work with, so Okay, so all the blast spaces go back in here because I after having gone through the entire guide and I'm not going to need them immediately. This actually looks like a lot of rear suspension stuff, so maybe I've screwed this up. Yeah, because there's only those arms, so What's the time? We're doing pretty well for time, I think. Cool. Seal that off. Ah, oh, here we go. Yeah. Let's do that. Cool. So there's a lot of tiny set screws here, and that does not fill me with a lot of confidence. So what parts do we need? We need one of you, and we need the other one of you. And are you metal or are you plastic? Hard to tell, honestly. I've got a feeling it might actually be metal, so... Careful, careful, careful. Don't even know why... Oh, actually, that... that that brass part does have quite a bit of heft to it, so maybe it actually was worth making it out of um, brass. Uh, instructions, spaces, balls, and cups. Gonna need four of these. Um, I'm not seeing any shafts here. Which leads me to believe they're part of this kit. So let's make sure I've got everything I need and then we'll put everything back and then we'll look in the other kit. I don't want to cross-contaminate these bags. Um, that's a good way to 
make things harder on myself. I mean, in all honesty, there's no real reason to go fast with any of this, um, other than like the mind numbingness of how slow it all is. Um, but we will see. I mean, there's even a good chance that I might only do two streams over the weekend of this, take a bit of a longer break, and then do some on Monday. Um, I actually am trying to race BMR3 to completion on this. Which I don't know if that'll annoy him or not. Um, well, there's a bit of, at least in my mind, an informal competition. I was the first one to get an unboxing up on stream. Um, just one of those spaces. Yeah. And uh, then he immediately followed like two hours later. So, and even then, like I, I delayed my unboxing by a couple of hours. So, but uh, like the reason I, I'd want to do something like that is just to get some numbers on my YouTube channel. Um, either way, as soon as he posted, he just blew me out of the water, but he's got a lot more people following him. So, that's fine. I'm never going to be that big. Uh, let's that's zeroed. That's about eight. Take two of those. Put one of you on top. This should be a tight fit, so they should stay in place. Now, I was talking before about the shafts and them being a pain. The particular type of setup they've got here is all right because. The problem I had um, with these white pins on shafts was when you couldn't put them on ahead of time. So we're able to put these on ahead of time, which makes it a lot simpler. But if we had of, if we have to push the pin through and then insert them into a gap and then push the push through, that's when it's an issue. When it's just like put it on ahead of time, then slide it in, then it's a real no-brainer to do. Now, are these parts symmetrical? They do appear to be symmetrical. And I'll go you on the outside. Now, there is actually a nice little trick here. I'll show you in a minute. Um, we grab our pliers. We don't mess up our table. And we just lightly lightly very very lightly squeeze that all together um, this part doesn't need to freely rotate the thing it's mounted in does it needs to freely rotate in but this part can ah uh, and in fact it did exactly what i didn't want it to do um, i was hoping that it would just stay together and then i wouldn't have to worry about it coming apart but that doesn't look like the case that's fine we will now just insert in like that I said we will now just insert, oh it's going to pop in. Okay, so it's just important to observe direction. And then be very, very careful around this while I'm doing it. So, slide the pin off, insert a white thing on the end, put a black thing on the end, and we've got a shaft. Then we take a look at that. We observe the right direction, force it through, put another thing on the end there, and then we clip that one in as well. Now I actually took three of those white things out, and that's just from experience, uh, knowing that I might possibly lose one. So we'll have to make sure we put that back in a sec so we don't lose it. But squeeze on the shaft. And it's a bit hard to tell because the camera's not focusing very well, but it's all looking pretty good. It's not exactly, it's still a bit, oh, I don't want to say dangerous, but you just have to be careful around it. And we just now test that it goes up and down without too many issues. And I'm just testing for binding now. 
and it's going to be difficult to get on, so I'm actually going to use some pliers here. Maybe I wanted to glue these on, because they're proving to be a real pain. Okay, I'm going to avoid touching that for now. Let's put that white thing back. That's what I was really hoping wouldn't happen. Okay, cool. Uh, let's scroll down. Okay, so we put the front on almost immediately, which is good. Uh, what do I do with that? We put that away, because we're not going to need it. If you do have a nice small parts divider, uh, I definitely recommend using it, because it means you can just have, you don't have to worry about packing the bags. Um, I do actually have a couple of them. If I was smart, I'd actually pull them out and use them. The reason I'm not doing that, however, is because I'm currently using them for other projects. So I guess the lesson here is only ever do one project at a time, because otherwise you're going to need a significant amount more tools. I'm looking for a yellow. Oh. Why'd that go over there? So we want that. And we want that. So we're going to put this on and then we're going to go back and readdress any binding issues. Um, this is the front suspension and the front suspension is actually very, very important in this setup. And so we want to spend a bit of extra time just getting it right here. So that goes in like that. No need to force it. Oh, actually, if I got that wrong, no, that was right. Oh, it's actually go up on the top. I think that might go on the top. Oh yeah, it does look like it does. That's doubly irritating because that isn't a, a good fit either. So we push this through like that. Slide on the front carefully or not. Okay, we're getting a tiny bit of binding here. There we go, and it's on. So we now just do a quick test, and oh God. nose is dripping, which means it's not COVID-19. It is actually a cold, because a dripping nose is not a symptom of COVID-19. So you just lift, up, lift the arm up, and just make sure it just slides down under its own gravity. Now, if we do it on the right-hand side, it doesn't actually happen. So there's a couple of ways we can address this. Um, I think I'm actually going to polish the shaft a bit. Um, Induendo aside, this is one of... There's a couple of ways to do it. You can either make the balls a, a bit smaller by polishing them. Um, but I actually want a tight fit on them. I'd rather have the, uh, the shaft itself be a bit, um, be the point it's rotating on. Okay, I can't do that. That's fine, because that's captured. This is 3,000. Now, I don't have a good way to do this, um, so I'm just going to do it the way I do it. I could use a Dremel. Um, I just don't want to pull it out, and I don't know where I've got it at the moment. So I've done a loop around it, and then I'm just rotating it in my fingers. And we're just trying to shave. We're not caring about a good edge per se. We're just, we just care about more about shaving some of its diameter off. So doing it this way is good because it allows us to keep the forces pretty even. Do it for a bit, then you do um, a test fit. So in my fingers, that feels a lot smoother, but the real litmus test is once you actually fit the part. Yep, 
Oh, actually, I, I'm really not making... I actually had that back to front. So I just lost one of those white things again. Let me do a quick check here. And another useful tool to have is actually a torch. It makes finding springs and things a lot simpler. And I can't see it. So what I'll do is I'll just grab another white spacer. And we're just going to blow through them as we need them. And hope that they gave an excessive amount of space for this. Especially given how much they charge for them. There we go. Now, the light's actually starting to decay here. Um, so I'm going to have to really consider about what we do in terms of finishing up here. I definitely don't think I'm going to get this done tomorrow. But I think this build process in itself uh, is of pretty massive benefit to uh, some people. So that's all right. I'd rather spend time focusing on the process of building these. And that white thing is right there. So I'm going to put it in the parts bin for when I need it next. Uh, focus on the process of building this and getting tips and hints for people who are looking to do this themselves. Because like building mini Z, mini Zs like this is not actually particularly difficult, um, especially once you've learned some of the tricks. But it is time consuming. Uh, if you need something to eat up a lot of your free time, this is definitely a good hobby for that. Okay. Now I just did a quick drop test there, and it was behaving exactly like the other one. So I think I polished it off enough. Okay, you're looking good. And then we do we capture both of those in this. If I can get you in like that. Bingo. And it still seems to be struggling a tiny bit, but let's pop it all the way in. And they're about the same now. Uh, I'm just going to live with that, I think. So now I have to find the screws that we're using here. Um, now they're interesting in that they're actually black on the picture. Um, but I... Oh no, they're not there. It's just the angle. So they're M7 flats. Um... So I think I got the right screw, but once again, I'm always going to double, double check by measuring these things. Yeah, okay, so that's not an M7. That looks like it. Yep, okay, it came out identically. And you are a screw head. So we're going to start threading this through. Not all the way, and I'll show you why in a sec. Just so it retains itself. Um, we've actually got three parts on top of each other, and that can be difficult to pull off. So we just try and thread the first two parts, then position the third part. And if you just check the top here and run your finger over the top, uh, nothing's protruding, so we know we're good. So we can place the third part now. Um, this is a very, very oddly shaped part as well, which means holding it in place is going to be difficult. And I'm going to try one other trick. I'm actually going to make the screws protrude just by about half a mil, so just so I can see them protruding. And then that means if I put this other part on top, they should, it should catch on the edges and sort of guide it into place. And you as well. Okay. That doesn't mean you can just screw from that point. Um, if you do that, you're still likely, you're very likely to introduce problems. So what you have to do 
Let's line it up. Uh, once you're happy with it, you back it out half rotation and keep on applying pressure and then you rotate it forward and then you do for the other screw. And that just means you get the threads lining up correctly. Um, if you had it pushed forward, you can actually end up pushing the part out further and you end up with a small gap. Okay, so now it's offering a bit of resistance. Now this is going into a metal part, so I'm just, I don't mind providing a bit of extra force. Although that second one is a lot cleaner, so maybe I need to just go and play with that thread a bit more. So backing the screw out all the way again, and then backing it down and seeing if it goes in smoother, and it doesn't. So we're just going to overcome that. I'm hoping I didn't cross thread, but you also never know with that sort of thing. Uh, I can't see a gap and it seems flat, so that's good. They're tight. Um, we do a quick test with the arm. And that actually seems to be binding. And that is binding on the button screw head, so I didn't tighten them up enough. So now is a good chance to address that. I've got a feeling that they can't go in any further, to be honest, but we'll see what we can do. Yeah, that's very, very tight. Yeah, let's try applying some pressure from the bottom. Oh yeah, that seems to help a bit. And let's do the other side. So just take your time. Double check all the movements of all the different parts. Oh yeah. I've, maybe I didn't use the right screws and that could be the problem here. I'm not seeing anything that looks remotely applicable here though. Maybe this button head. I mean, this is the exact reason why you shouldn't have so many different types of screws. Maybe that. Yeah, that, that looks like the exact same type of screw. Let, let's try that. I'm actually going to swap out some of the screws. So as long as I can find a sister screw to this one, I've got a good indication that it might actually be that screw I should have used. Um, having so many different types of screws is an example of bad design in my opinion. So I'm going to, only going to undo one screw at a time, just so that I don't have everything fall apart. So it's funny, the, it's um, only not clearing by like half a millimetre. It's um, absolutely insane. Okay, that's binding, that's good. And that's going b below the surface, which is even better. That's what we wanted. We want a nice clean edge there, so I can test that first one. sort of passes and it's go down a bit further but that's we can fix that with a bit of pressure I've got a, a feeling that uh, Atomic tried to push the envelope too too much on this one on the front end um, like clearance should not ever be this much of an issue But it wouldn't be the first time. Um, I actually normally prefer GL Racing to um, Atomic. Like, they just seem to have better... Like, the plastics are better. Everything's just slightly better thought out. It's hard to put, like, a finger on it, but it's just, like... 
everything is just magically better. It's a lot more straightforward. It's a lot simpler, a lot more reliable. Like, the, as I said, incredibly good plastics. Um, everything is just so smooth without doing any work at all. Uh, if I was going to make a recommendation, it would be for GL Racing for your first kit compared to... Um, oh, actually, if I provide some force down on that, that's that's actually really smooth. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so I think this this part's just bent over a bit too much. Um, and that should be fixed when the brace gets attached to that. So I'm happy to leave that for the moment. Uh, it's now 3.04. Uh, where do I want to get to? We might see if we can get up to the front knuckles and then call it done. Um, I'm getting very, very hungry and very, very thirsty at this point, so... Okay, so let's have a look. What do we need to pull this off? We have to make two turn buckles. Uh, this is so annoying. This is one of these things I actually didn't want to do on stream. So the turn buckle parts are there. I just can't see the lower turn buckle things. So that actually might be in that other bag I had. Yes, it is. Okay. So we're going to get the lower turnbuckles in place first. Um, just because they're easy. Let's flip you around. Oh, actually, that's interesting. That slid in too quickly. So maybe that's the wrong size part. Okay, that's nice. They've got multiple parts that are similar but different sizes. So that means, well, actually I'm torn on that. On one hand, it means less confusion because uh, if it fits, it, it works. But on the other hand, if you didn't notice that, you could be tearing your hair out. Um, and there's definitely an advantage to it all just being the same part rather than having multiple parts. So you don't have to worry about which one's which. Okay, so they're in. Awesome. Now I'm going to have two bags open at once. Um, so let's do that. And we'll leave some parts in there so I know which bag's which. So we need the longer turn buckles. Then we need some end caps. So we need four of those and then two of these. Do we need any spaces? No, we don't. Okay, so we can now put away all these parts. Actually, you know what? I've actually probably got the title for this incorrect, don't I? Battletech. Uh. <laughs> oh, God. Building mini Z D R Z. I need to work out how to automate this. V two. Change that to I R L. Done. Okay, so that was completely and absolutely stupid of me. And we go back to the stream and start packing parts. Not that it's really going to make a difference, but I prefer these things are correctly labeled. 
Bum, 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 bum. A, uh, another pro tip here is magnets. Um, magnets can make this a lot simpler because you can just pick the parts up in bulk. Uh, there's definitely some downsides, especially when you're picking up parts you don't intend to. Cool. Now, we're going to focus on these arms on the chassis first. Just so I don't have to think about them again. Actually, I'll take off these small parts. And do this. So I think from memory these are reverse threaded. But I'm just looking at the thread and twisting as appropriate. So getting these straight is definitely worth it. Well, that was simpler than it, I thought it'd be. So GL racing, um, threading on turnbuckles like this was always really, really simple. Atomic, not so much. Um, I used to struggle with it quite a bit. Um, but these have gone on very, 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 very smoothly. Like, I was expecting to spend an hour just on this step, so... No, nope, that didn't want to happen. How's that? Yeah, that's a bit better. Twisted more. Okay, no, that didn't work. Can swap hands again. Um, okay, let's try that. And that went beautifully. Okay. I've just got a bit more accuracy in my right hand. Um, my hands don't shake badly these days, but I used to have real problems with that. So let's go to one millimeter. Just quickly measure that. Ah, one millimeter on the dot. Almost like I planned it. That needs three rotations. Don't ask me how I know that. Yep, perfect. And I was correct, it was three rotations. Screw those on. I'll uh, show off the chassis in just a bit. Um, so bear with me for a moment. Mm -hmm. Rotate you on. Looks good. Back you off half a turn. Good. So we've now got both arms on like that. Now, I'm a bit concerned in that they're not flowing free, but it seems like the uh, compression that way uh, has caused me to lose a bit of that motion. So I suspect once we get a... Well, even the tires aren't doing it. I was going to say, I hope the, the weight of the wheel causes that to fall back down, but it looks like it isn't. So I might actually have to undo that end and... and um, smooth everything up again to make that uh, flow really, really freely. But for the moment, I just want to kick on. Okay, so let's do our turnbuckles. It's just those first couple of rotations that are always difficult. And they also set whether or not you've got everything straight, which is even more annoying. So it's possible to screw up right at the beginning and not realize it till the end um, and cause yourself a lot of grief. 
So that's on. Okay. These are threaded the other way as well. And the reason for that is it's just the way that these adjustable turnbuckles work. If they were threaded both the same way, then the turnbuckle would only move back and forward and it wouldn't actually bring the two closer together. Okay. Let's go to 7mm. I think I need to replace the battery on this thing. Okay, so I've got a bit of work to do to make that tighter. So the easiest way to do that is to put something in the center uh, to rotate against and then to rotate them evenly and in the right direction. So you want equal spacing on either side of the turnbuckle. Ah, that hurt. Okay, so a full rotation from either side should now work. Should get this down to 7 mil. Okay, and... I think I went over, but that was intentional. There you go, back it off half. Yep, one turn buckle done. So I'm actually kind of surprised at how much uh, or how quickly I'm doing these because these have tr these and what's the other thing? No, I, I was going to say diffs as well, but um, that only applies to one tenth scale. Uh, one tenth scale diffs are painful to work with. Mini Z ones are a cakewalk in comparison. Uh, so I'd have to say turn buckles uh, and suspension setups are the most annoying on Mini Zs. Or Mini Z sized things. I actually wonder if the Mini Z um, diffs would scale up because they're just so easy to work on in comparison. The big thing with the one, one tenth scale diffs that presents a problem is a lot of them have um, a pin to hold things in place, but there's no direct access to thread that through. Um, you've got to worm it through in a very, very specific fashion for it to work. And normally there's fairly tight tolerances on that. And so you end up wasting like an hour or two just building a diff. And most of that's just getting that one pin in. Once you've got the one pin in though, it's um, pretty straightforward. Okay, we're just sizing it up. Still needs to be a bit tighter. I think I've over tightened it there, but we'll see. Yeah, back it off. Okay, right. two turn buckles done and in record time. Now there's one other trick with turnbuckles and you need the right light to see it. One side is shiny and one side is not and the shiny side goes onto the ball. So those cups are actually directional and they don't always tell you that. So we're going to use a small pair of pliers again and just press it in very, very lightly. This is a lot more difficult than it should be. Bam. So I felt that pop on. Oh, okay, so there's a lot of friction there. 
Wow, that's an incredibly large amount of friction. So we're going to have to polish things up. And what that means is I'm likely going to finish this stream very, very shortly because I'm going to polish them off stream. Um, yeah, so look at that. It's not even moving. There is so much friction there. It's not funny. Like I'm actually having to put, it's not a, a non-trivial amount of force there. I'm having to put quite a bit in there. So those all need to be polished up and made uh, easier to move. And so do these arms here. Uh, I really should be focusing on what's on camera. So basically everything needs a polish. Um, although some of the difficulty is in the building of these things because it's fiddly. Ugh. And I watched the video as well. This is annoying. Do I want to get out of the way? Yeah, let's work on that. We'll do this as a last step. And once we've gone to here, uh, I'm going to call it done for today. Um, I think that's a pretty good milestone. And then that allows me to polish it. Um, all the different parts at my own leisure. Um, because that might be really, really quick, or it might take me hours and hours and hours. So, no, I'm also very, very cautious about making this video too long. Um, it's probably fine if you're watching it and looking at the numbers at the moment. There aren't actually too many people watching at the moment, uh, which is not an issue. But if I upload it to YouTube as is, that presents a bit of an issue. So that's a 12 mil pin. Let's put that all in my hand. Okay. Now I'm noticing a couple of distinct thicknesses here, so... Let's line these up. Let's take you out and sample you. Now the other thing is, if your measurements don't come out exactly at 12 mil, I wouldn't be too worried about that. As long as they come out close enough. You're way too thick, so if I missed a pin. Yes, I have. So there definitely seems to be a 12.5 and a 10.5 mil shaft here. And I'm going to assume the 10.5s are the ones I want for the 11s and definitely not the 12.5s. Yeah. So not all measurements are exact and especially when it comes to these rods, they're actually woefully inaccurate. Um, measure everything and then take the best fit. Okay, so we're gonna need some white things. I've got one of the white things there. I need some more from here. And then with any luck, I think this is the last of those white spaces, so that will be a pretty big win. Which means, if that's the case, they did give a lot of extras. you in there and put everything else back oh god I'm getting so bored already I just want this to be done um, now we need a one of you or are you too fine I think you bounced all over the place and might be too fine so let's grab two micro grub screws I don't like rubber screws as a mechanism to secure things. Um, it's a cheap way out. It's so easy to loosen them, so easy uh, to lose them, so easy to uh, not get them tight enough. Um, Loctite can be annoying with them. They're just generally painful to work with. So I need those arms. 
I need that to be facing backwards relative. Oh, that's the other thing. These black arms um, pay very, very close attention to them. They're subtly asymmetric. Um, and that will actually affect your camber. Now, I'd love to give you a close-up shot for this. Um, in fact, I'd love to give you like a, a nice uh, view of what um, I'm doing and seeing from my eyes, but that's not the easiest thing to do in the world. And I think the benefit's more in my explanations of what's going on than uh, actually seeing it being done. Um, if you do have questions about specific things, feel free to ask them, either on YouTube comments uh, or on Twitch uh, chat, and I can get it fixed there. Uh, I can demonstrate it then. Does that go in like that? Yes, it does. And what does a grub... Oh, man, that, that grub screw setup is horrible. Huh. Yeah, their polishing is very, very, very boring, so. Okay, now this is a very, very delicate procedure here. Um, can be sometimes easy to do it one by one. Uh, you definitely want to capture it with your finger and put it over the top there. And then you need something fine to just sort of maneuver it into place. Um... And being very, very careful not to launch it across the room. Which I've already done once today. Uh, push that over. Squeeze it on. And then move on to the next one. Okay, so once again that went a lot simpler than I remember it. It's very hard to tell if this is just experience doing it now. Or if they've actually actively improved everything, the actual uh, building process. And I'm inclined to believe it's more to do with experience, only because I've had such terrible experiences with Atomic that um, I really don't think they can... Ah, uh, and it fell off. I really don't think they considered a lot of this stuff. Like, it really feels like this... Um, model was designed without actually having built thinking about how it would be built and the fact that you're, you're doing a lot of high precision fiddly work that humans should never actually ever be be doing actually maybe that's an easy way to do it if i do if i get those on top in advance and i shuffle them over If I'm lucky, I can now place this part over the top. And no, I had one of them fall out. I had both of them fall out. And now because they're white, the next one possible to see. So it was interesting. Um, uh, the uh, Probably about a month or two ago, we had a pottery class as a work team building exercise. And because I've got all my modeling stuff next to my PC, and we were doing it over uh, video conferencing, um, I'd all of a sudden like just pull out a torch just to check the lighting on a, like a particular part. And I had all these like crazy tools available to build uh, my actual mug itself. Um, and I got a couple of interesting uh, comments about that after the event. Okay. You go on top. Uh, how did I lose that one? I must say, I'm kind of disappointed in Atomic for continuing to pursue this white um, spacer idea. It, it just... It's absolutely horrible. I'm doing this completely wrong. That's why it's so difficult. I should be threading it onto this. Yeah. So I should be going from the front, not the back. 
Uh, let me check the picture. That's good. So we feed it in like that. And then we put the white pins on top of that. That should work. It's still fiddly, don't get me wrong. But once we've got it on, um, our issues end with, whereas with every other method, um, it gets even more and more difficult. So that's on and I now push that through and that's now retained and I push that back and I've now got room for the next one. Oh, this is so much nicer. And then I can just use that to hook that onto the top. Okay, that's looking good. And then I push that through and I feel the compression. Slide the back one up to be level. I'll let the pin slide down to the bottom. And now, if you see, I've got them retained like that. So that's a lot easier to work with. And that's from the front. I now just go like slide that on underneath. Like that. And I can now push the pin up. Okay, cool. So that's working well. And as you can see, it just dangles down fairly easily. Um, so let's have a look at these retaining. Let's see if you can even see them. So, I mean, you, that probably gives you an idea of how tiny they are. If, even when up close, they still look tiny like that. These are hex heads. And hopefully this hex piece works with it. Because I want to use my good screwdriver for this. No, it doesn't look like it does. Oh, actually, they're, um, they're, they've got a cross pattern on them. Wow, that's, that's so incredibly tiny, it's not funny. I, ha I hate parts this small, it's just... So annoying they continue to use these. So let's screw that in. From the top. And now I'm feeling some tension, so I'm going to assume that's retained. Give it a tiny bit of extra push there. So I just burnt through two of those white things, so I need to pull some more out of my magic bag. I'm regretting my decision to do this already, especially on camera. Like, this is stressful enough doing it when it's not on camera. Although, I have to admit, doing it on camera actually probably doesn't make it that much harder. <coughs> it is wearing my throat out already, and my throat's been pretty bad the last couple of weeks. So we go from the front. I need the pin. I need the pin. Where is the pin? Oh crap, oh there's a pin. Okay, so there are no spare pins. <laughs> That's why I was concerned. Um, let's go over the top here. Once again, I'm not, you're not going to be able to see this from your angle, but I've really got to optim... For a lot of these parts, I actually have to optimize for me being able to do it rather than you guys being able to see it because it's already just so difficult. Okay, pin gets dropped down like that. My finger's probably got a bit too much oil on at the moment. There we go, that went on. Push it through, stamping up like that. And we're back to having the white spacer thingy. Go from the front, like that, 
and then push it through. Okay, so that went a lot quicker than I thought it would. Um, that was probably the scariest part. Well, not the that, I thought that part was going to be the most difficult, and I want to say we blew through that in record time. Um, those white spaces, like I went through about three of them just so far. Um, they're annoying. You, you will go through them like crazy and there's no avoiding it. Okay. Cool. So now we have a completed part. <coughs> One wing does not. Uh, they're about the same in terms of how freely they move, so that's good. Um, I could look at mounting them now, so it goes like that. And in fact, I might do that just to hold them in place. So these are going to be hex heads, so I'm going to pull out my good screwdriver. Should make it a bit easier as to which parts which as well. And check that in like that. Just a simple twist, and we find the next part. Okay, these are definitely not the best screws. There's quite a bit of um, play in the actual hex head part itself. So I'm only going to put those in lightly because I'm going to probably have to pull a lot of this apart. Um, I'm just checking the camber. Or maybe that is actually 15 degrees. Oh yeah, so that is a good screwdriver. Um, all high grade steel with ball bearings and removable heads. This is a bad screwdriver. This is a cheap $2 special from China. So you're right, it does imply that there are bad screwdrivers, and there actually are. Um, it may seem silly, but a bad screwdriver will cause you to strip out uh, screw heads. So there are actually, uh, there is actually a thing as bad screwdrivers. They're ones that cost you quite, uh, they end up costing you more money than they're worth. And especially on projects like this, stripping heads can be catastrophic. Um, it's very, very difficult to remove a screw after the fact, and even more so at this scale. So, uh, I could put some arms in the top and be done with that. And in fact, let's go with that, because that seems relatively simple. And then that'll be the end of the front suspension I want to deal with today. Um, and I'll probably end up stopping. Um, my throat is starting to really kill me, so. And my voice has been bad all week. Um, there we go. Actually, this is probably a good example of the quality of Atomic products um, and why I question why they're considered a premium brand. So look at the extra, extra plastic on there. Um, that's actually pretty bad. It's simple to remove, but it's um, normally indicates that their attention to detail is a tiny bit lacking. Or their tools are not kept sharp, um, which causes burring, which is what I'm just removing now from the inside. It's a pretty there's some pretty bad uh, burrs, which are, um, especially for a turnbuckle, uh, that can be really, 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 really poor. Okay. So we just mate, mate these. And they're going on super well, super quickly. Let's measure up two mil. I'm going to call 1.95 close enough. Uh, 
go. I need about five turns. In fact, I actually can't get enough grip on this part, so I'm going to bring in some screwdrivers. Uh, so, some pliers. And even with the pliers, I'm uh, slipping pretty badly. Half a turn. There we go. Now, hopefully this should slide right into the side of the chassis fairly well at the top here. So we're doing this part around here. Doing this part here. I think I need a better and more visible mouse cursor. Okay, yeah, that, that's actually going in pretty smoothly. So the plastics are definitely better. Um, the quality control is just not there still. But, I mean, we saw better plastics with the BZ3. Um, even though it had a lot of metal parts, the plastics that were done were exceptional. But this is seeming to indicate to me that they're not maintaining their tools as well. Um, is that facing the right way up? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. Which is a bit of a concern. I mean, if I, if I had to clean up that turnbuckle, um, and I've already got a couple other turnbuckles that are high friction, um, that's not a good sign. Like, some people might like that extra work, but, I mean, you look at how nicely a gel racing chassis goes together, and it's like it's like night and day. Like, they, the GL racing chassis goes together just so smoothly and with so few issues that I'd actually recommend it to someone who's had very little experience at this scale um, and being able to successfully pull it off without too much trouble. Um, the Atomics, they've got some nice models that do stuff that no one else does, but you definitely pay for that, both in terms of money and just complexity. Let's back that off, half a turn. Okay, and that looks to be pre-threaded, so that's going in smoothly. I say that, but go in, go in, damn it, there we go. Oh no, you're still off, I don't want to cross-thread here. That looks better. And I'm just going to rotate the entire chassis for leverage. And that had the complete opposite effect to what I wanted. Um, that actually caused the turnbuckle to go in. So we're going to grip that loosely and then rotate the body again. So you've actually got to be really, you know what, that should have actually had a hex head on it. That would have made it easier. Um, you've got to be really careful not to over tighten these turnbuckles because they will buckle. And you don't get any warning of that. God, there's still sprue lines to clean up on this one as well. Man, not a good one. And I think I'm going to have to put some Loctite in it because I'm backing it out now. Which means it's all a tiny bit too loose for my liking. One of the interesting things about... Like some of these... Some things I might be doing may look like guesses. 
So I'm, I'll say something like, oh, I'm measuring it at 1.7. Um, and then to just take that as equivalent to two. The reason I'm doing that is I'm backing it off by like one rotation on the thread visually. And I know that they, because this turnbuckle has to be orientated in a very, very specific direction, um, that the math should work out. So because, because it's, uh, it's got to be like dead flat with the top here. Um, and there's only so many uh, levels of thread. They would have had to have calculated what angle of thread to use by how far they wanted to be out and then still have the um, that actually flat. So I can take it to 1.7 and then back it out and then just know it will be at 2. Um, just due to the nature of how everything has to be orientated in the final build. Okay, so those arms are looking good. Bottom arms are not too bad, but still have a bit too much friction for my liking. Um, these steering arms, control arms, are, have too much friction, and I need a Dremel to fix that. Um, basically, what you do is you put a one of these bulb heads here in the end of a Dremel, and then you pop the uh, turnbuckle on top. And then you put it up to maximum, or you, you start having it rotate, and you have it rotate quickly enough that it causes friction and melts the, the plastic slightly. And that way you get a tight fit um, that's also very, very smooth. So, great trick there. Um, with that, I'm going to finish this up here. Uh, I'll be doing another run tomorrow. Um, I just want to get this up to YouTube before it gets too long. Um, and there's a couple of people interested in this process. So... Uh, Thanks for joining us today. Um, there will be more tomorrow, as I said, and um, have a good afternoon. See you.